Lord Stern talks about that vegetarian comment in a post COP15 world. Reduction in meat would go along with a reduction uh, in emissions, like greater use of public transport, um, you know, buying the right kind of electricity, and so on. It's part of the information that any uh, thoughtful person trying to think through actions for themselves or how to contribute to policy for government. It's the kind of information that they would need. So uh, when you point to the advantages of public transport, you're not saying that nobody should use a private car. Uh, when you're pointing to different kinds of electricity, you're not insisting that everybody uses wind electricity, but you're pointing to the possibility. And similarly with food and any other thing that we look at, this kind of information is absolutely fundamental for rational public discussion. And that, I think, is a crucial point, because we're here at a social science. How many people here knew they were at a festival? There's one, two... Well, you are a social science festival, so I hope that, uh, you know, I know that jazz festivals sound more exciting than they probably are, but it's very important, and I wanted to pick up on that kind of um, remark about uh, diet and so on, that people need information presented in a careful, thoughtful way, in a context, about policy and about individual action. And as social scientists, that's, that's what our job is. To, gather information, to gather arguments, to put arguments together in a way that relate directly to policy. And what I want to argue here, and I'll do it by focusing particularly on the policy, is that the social scientists as a whole have a tremendous amount to bring to the table. And it's our responsibility to train and teach and use our social science in a way that really does um, contribute to what is arguably, um, and I will argue, the most fundamental problem of our time. But I want to do that in the context of the two defining challenges of our century. Unless we put them together, we will fail on both. The two defining challenges of our century are managing climate change and overcoming world poverty. If we don't manage climate change, the environment becomes so destructive that all the advances, and there have been major advances, that the world has made on development would be undermined and reversed. I will explain that uh, I think you can see the argument already, but I will explain. On the other hand, if in trying to manage climate change, we appear to put obstacles in the path of development, then um, we will not put together the coalition, and we won't deserve to put together the coalition which is fundamental to managing climate change. So those two defining challenges of our century are inextricably interlinked, and we succeed or fail on the two together. Now, in order to understand the risks that we run, let me just remind you of the processes at work here. Through our production and consumption activities, we as people emit greenhouse gases. Together, we currently emit far more than the planet can absorb. So that flow of emissions builds up to a stock. Yeah? We think of the carbon cycle to describe the process of absorption and so on. That uh, does lead to some absorption, but we're emitting so much that the stock of greenhouse gases is rising. It's the stock of greenhouse gases that traps the infrared energy. It's an old piece of physics. Um, it's a basic piece of physics is that certain gases with certain with molecules with certain structures prevent or inhibit, impede, the passage of long-wave radiation. Water wave radiation comes in from space, it's reflected back, as it's reflected back, some of it becomes infrared, and the more greenhouse gases there are, the more that that trapping takes place. It has to do with the vibration of the molecules at a rate which uh, it fears the passage of the longer wave radiation. This is basic physics, it's been understood really more or less since the end of the 19th century, and all the evidence since then has built up very powerfully. You may not like the rules of thermodynamics, or you may not like the laws of uh, gravitation, but because you dislike the laws of gravitation, it doesn't mean you can levitate, and ignoring these kinds of basic principles of uh, the greenhouse effect will lead us into deep, deep trouble. Well, 
it's not just the warming, because I haven't finished that. It's not just the warming, because what happens here is global temperatures go up, global temperatures go up, quite complicated interactions uh, around the world and the whole meteorological system, but what happens is the climate changes. And that means mostly impacts through water. Storms, floods and inundations, droughts and desertification, sea level rise. And that, of course, has very direct impact on people. Now, how big would that be? What are the risks associated with that process? Now, each of the five links that I gave along that chain, you were counting, I know, each of the five links in the chain of that process I just described has uncertainty in it. There's uncertainty about how much emissions will be. There's uncertainty about the carbon cycle and how much will be absorbed and therefore how much deconcentration will rise. There's uncertainty about the climate sensitivity and thus how much heat would be trapped. There's uncertainty about the effect of the uh, warming and the interactions globally and locally on overall climate. And there's uncertainty about those climatic changes, their effects on people. This is about risk management. And that is what social science will be telling us about, policy on risk management. How to manage risk in an effective, um, efficient, equitable manner. That's the challenge of all this. And we have to see it as a challenge of risk management. How big might those risks be? Well, would we go around the business as usual? We are around 435 parts per million. That's the concentrations at the moment, the CO2 equivalent. We're adding about two and a half parts per million a year. That two and a half is rising. A hundred years of that, instead of being 100 times 2.5, that 2.5 is rising. It'd be 100 times three or four on average. We'll be adding three or four hundred to the 435 that we are now. Business as usual would take us to at least 750 or so parts per million by the end of the century possibly more. Now, we don't know these probabilities exactly, but roughly a 50-50 chance or thereabouts of being above four and a half or five degrees centigrade as a result of that. We haven't been there as a planet for 30 million years. We as humans have been around, well, Homo sapiens anyway, have been around for about 200,000. 200,000, that's us, versus 30 million years. We haven't seen that kind of temperature. We don't know what it would look like. But we can surely suggest with some strength that the risks involved in those kinds of changes would be immense. Very recently we were about five degrees less, 10 to 12,000 years ago, the last ice age. That transformed the planet. We were all living closer to the equator than Watford. In other countries I say London, but here you understand the job is a bit better. This kind of change moves people. It moves people on a massive scale. If you think about the likelihood that much of southern Europe would be a desert, that the Sahara Desert would probably be significantly expanded, that much of Bangladesh would be underwater and more of it coming underwater, that the North Indian monsoon would likely to change rapidly, that the whole pattern of flows off the Himalayas would likely to change rapidly. In other words, the changing patterns of the great rivers of the world that feed populations of uh, one or two billion people. You have to regard there being a very big risk of hundreds of millions of people moving. And if we've learned anything from the history of the last couple of hundred years, if people move on a massive scale, and we haven't seen that scale of movement in the past, you're likely to get severe extended and global conflict. This is the scale of the story that we're talking about. Now we're um, in a middle class institution and we're taught by middle class people, we're brought up to, uh, not all of them of course, but on average, uh, and we're taught to use language carefully, not to exaggerate. And that's very important here. This is just a description of where this basic process is likely to take us, with all the notions of risk management and probability that we have to bring to bear. But these are massive risks by anybody's standards. So what do we do? Well, many scientists have argued, and I think there's a powerful case, that we should have as a target two degrees centigrade, a maximum of two degrees centigrade. Now, because of what I've already said about the stochastic nature, the random nature of some of these processes, the uncertainties about the magnitudes of the effects, we have to speak about targets in a probabilistic sense. So we have to talk about a 50-50 chance of two degrees centigrade. 
Why is that kind of number of temperature increase uh, indicated? Well, the reason for that is that we risk, as you go much above, quite powerful feedback effects. It's possible that the Amazon will start to dry out and die back. It's possible that, in fact, it, 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 it's probably probable, that the uh, permafrost would start to uh, warm up and melt, thaw, in a way that would release massive amounts of methane. The disappearance of ice sheets, which will start to get bigger and bigger, reduces the albedo effect, so it means that uh, less of the ultraviolet is reflected back into space. These are positive feedback effects, so which will start to uh, run the risk of dynamically unstable processes where things will get worse and worse because if the Amazon dies back, then you, that sink starts to go away. If the uh, methane is released, then uh, you've got a very potent greenhouse gas in very large quantities and so on. So these are the kinds of risks we run and the kinds of reasons why uh, targets around 2 degrees centigrade were suggested. I think it's a very powerful scientific case for that. So, if we take that as a target, what do we have to do? Well, again, the story from the science, with all the qualifications of our probabilities, gives us quite strong guidance. What's the best guess we can make at the kinds of emissions program for the world as a whole, which could generate a 50-50 chance of 2 degrees centigrade? Very good work by the uh, Hadley Center here, by my colleagues um, at, here at uh, the Radford Institute and at the ESRC Center, uh, Nicola Ranger, Alex Bone, and others who've been working in this area. And roughly speaking, the kind of target path that we need would look like this. Going from around 47, you've got to remember all these numbers because the numbers cap, 47 billion tons per annum roughly now, would have been about 50 had it not been for the world recession. Down to around 44 billion tons in 2020, down to a good deal less than 35 billion tons in 2030, and a good deal less than 20 billion tons in 2050. Now you can do a bit more now, a bit less later, or a little less now, and a bit more later, but roughly speaking, those paths look like that. Clearly, if we're 44 in uh, 2020 and we're 47 now, we must, have we must have peaked between now and then. So we clearly have to peak before 2020. That's roughly speaking what the paths look like. And they're very, they involve clearly very radical change. Um, if we got below, and we'd have to be well below 20 billion tons in 2050, given that the 7 billion people now is likely to grow to 9 billion by 2050 or thereabouts, that means around 2 tons per capita in 2050. We are in Europe 10, 11, 12 tons per capita now. The United States, Australia, Canada, well over 20 um, tons per capita CO2 equivalent. Um, China about 6, a little more. India a bit less than 2, much of sub-Saharan Africa a good deal less than 1 ton per capita. So you see the first the overall magnitude of the change that we have to make to come down from close to 50 to well below 20 in the next 40 years at a time where population is growing, at a time where the top income is growing. So you see the scale of the problem, but you also see the inequity. Because about 60% of the, or more, of the concentrations that are there now come from past emissions from rich countries. And it's the poor countries that are hit earliest and hardest. It's the poor countries who are waking up to the future now where well, we have to find low carbon growth, we all have to find low carbon growth, but they note with some uh, anger that the rich countries got rich through high carbon growth. So you can see the sense of injustice and inequity, and it's a very real part of the politics of this whole story. But we can see where we might go if we don't act sensibly. We can give a definition of what acting sensibly means in terms of two degrees centigrade, and we can see what that means in terms of emissions reductions. And we can see what that means in terms of reductions in emissions per unit of output. If world output grows at two or three or so percent for the next 40 years, suppose, then uh, it might go up by a factor of two and a half or three over 40 years. 
if we're cutting by a factor of two and a half and we're going up by a factor of three in terms of output, then we have to cut emissions per unit output by three times two and a half. So we have to cut emissions per unit output of the world by a factor of seven or eight. A factor of seven or eight. There'll be some areas where it won't be so easy to do that. So it means that where we can, we have to go essentially to zero carbon emissions. For example, zero carbon electricity. If we can find zero carbon electricity, we can describe how to do that, then we can get zero carbon road transport. So there'll be some areas like uh, agriculture, where there's a lot that can be done, but it's difficult to get it down to zero. Uh, some areas like aviation, where we're going to have to find new fuels if we have any chance of getting that down to anything like zero. But you can see that the basic logic of the kind I've described tells us what we have to do. Now, is it burdensome? Is it frightening? Is it possible? Well, if we do it well, it will be extremely attractive. The transition to low carbon growth was already, and you can see the signs of it already, the transition to low carbon growth should be more dynamic, or at least as probably more dynamic than the changes brought about by steam engines and the railways, electricity, um, motor car, uh, information technology, and so on. This is going to have to be a radical energy and industrial revolution. But we can see the signs of it already. We can already see what zero carbon electricity looks like. Uh, we know about wind, we, we know about solar, um, we know about nuclear. We can see carbon capture and storage for uh, generation of electricity from hydrocarbons, you know, there's geothermal, there are all kinds of ways in which this might come about. We can see the third and fourth generation of biofuels. Um, very big concentration in some places on algae. It's very hard to give a lecture on this to an audience with industrialists without going away with your pocket full of cards and people got brilliant ideas all the way from no-till uh, agriculture uh, to insulation of houses and new materials, to algae and all that before you talk about the generation of electricity. If only 10 or 15 percent of the ideas that are out there now are sane and 80 to 85 percent are insane, we would still have the kind of technological progress that would generate the kind of changes I'm talking about. So this is a very exciting prospect. It's very important to be clear about the risks but it's also very important to be clear about the real possibilities of this change. We could be in for a very dynamic period of growth in the transition to low carbon economy, and the low carbon economy itself will be um, cleaner, quieter, <coughs> safer, more energy secure, more biodiverse. So it's not simply seeing the big risk, which we must, but it is also seeing the attractiveness and the feasibility of the different ways of doing things. Now that's where we have to set ourselves up. Now that's the whole basis for the story in Copenhagen. And unless we share an understanding of the risks, unless we share an understanding of the possibilities, we will not come to the kind of collective action which will be fundamental. So let me spend the rest of my time on Copenhagen itself and on where we go from there. But the foundations in those two stories that I've told of management of risk and recognizing that it's very big and the attractiveness of the story and the transition to low carbon growth and then low carbon growth itself are absolutely fundamental. Unless we win the argument through analysis, through demonstration about low carbon growth, the politics of getting this is going to be extremely difficult. Now, I believe that we can win that argument and we're already seeing the power of the example. But it needs to get a lot stronger and much and uh, very quickly. Now, what about Copenhagen? Well, um, it was pretty chaotic. It was pretty disappointing. There are a few of you here, not many, but there's just a few of you here who remember student politics of the 1960s. The chaos of the discussion reminded me very much of points of order being made at students' union meetings and the insistence on total unanimity and that the president of the union had no margin of negotiation whatsoever. If he gave an inch to the university authorities, they would have to come back to the students' union meeting and renegotiate to the That's the kind of atmospherics that you can think about in uh, Copenhagen. It was wearing, and it was tiring, and it was disappointing. But 
on the road to Copenhagen, many people from many countries articulated their own targets for the first time, including the United States and China, targets for emissions reductions. More than 100 presidents and prime ministers came to Copenhagen as a demonstration of their concern with the seriousness of the issue and the willingness to try to grapple with the difficulties of getting an agreement. When I was writing a report for the Commission for Africa in 2004-2005, we went to Glen Eagles for the G8 summit. There were two subjects there in Glen Eagles, Scotland. There were two subjects, um, Africa and climate change. I was there to conduct the report for the Commission for Africa, but I listened in on some of the discussions on climate change. There was eye rolling, uh, boredom, yawning. There were two or three of the G8, generously speaking now, who took this subject seriously. This was a transformation in terms of the world politics of this in a period of four or five years. So the fact that emissions reduction targets came in before Copenhagen, the fact that there were so many people there, and the fact that you've got a Copenhagen Accord which said two degrees centigrade as the target. It said $100 billion per annum of finance reached to poor countries by 2020. It argued for a high-level panel to generate suggestions on new sources of money. It made significant progress on forestry and uh, on stopping deforestation and, uh, and so on. Those are basic, gave us a basic platform for moving forward. Has that basic platform, as it has seen then, has it started to turn into a real platform? Yes, it has. Because in Copenhagen, there are two annexes. This is the stuff of international negotiations. You've got an annexes. There are annexes, one for the rich countries and one for the poor countries, to, by January 31st, to fill in their uh, emissions ambitions, or emissions reductions ambitions. Um, over 70 countries covering more than 80% of the emissions have submitted, covering more than 80% of the emissions have submitted by that, well, at or close to that uh, January 31st deadline. The high-level panel, chaired by Melissa Nawe, Prime Minister of Ethiopia, who proposed the target on finance and proposed the panel. That panel has been set up, co-chaired by Melissa Sanawe and by Gordon Brown, currently Prime Minister of the UK. The, um, those two will be co-chairs. There's a panel of some very strong people, Montek Singh Alawali, the head of planning commission in India, President uh, of Jagdeo of Guyana, Prime Minister of uh, Norway, Trevor Manuel, the look on the longest serving outstanding finance ministers in the world from South Africa now working on the planning story in South Africa. These are the kind of people who are on this. It should be a serious panel, uh, federal worse. I'm a member of this panel, and I, that panel is starting to work. There's a meeting at the end of this month, 31st of March, in London. Last week, that story of the deforestation, the combating deforestation, so called Paris Oslo process, to take that forward, a constructive meeting on March the 11th in Paris, and now $4.5 billion pledged to support deforestation. Great welcoming by Brazil and other uh, rainforest nations for the progress that's been made there. This is now with the submissions by January 31st, with the work starting on the high-level panel on finance, with the progress on uh, deforestation. This isn't some abstract panel. This is not cleaning at stores. This is uh, serious work that is going on. And we're going to need serious, strong, analytical work on finance, on deforestation and reforestation, on technology and technology sharing, which is going less slowly than many of us would wish, and on monitoring and reporting and verification, understanding what other countries are doing. Those two areas, technology and so-called MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification, I think we're going to do slow on the analysis of finance, and the work on deforestation, we're starting to lose at a sensible pace. And we're having a discussion about the scale of emissions reduction. Now, what does that discussion look like on the scale of emissions reduction? I mentioned that submissions have come in now covering more than 80 percent of world emissions. Emissions ambition statements have come in in response to the Copenhagen Accord. What do they look like? Well, if you add them up, if you put them together, it looks as if, if everybody delivers, of course a big if, but if everybody delivers, it looks as if 
it would give us around 48 or 49 billion tons in 2020. Not so far away from where we are now. Now, I argue that we should be around 44. Uh, I also said you could do a bit more earlier and a bit less later, or a bit less earlier and a bit more later. There's no unique path that gets you there. And I think a more sensible path would look around 44, as I argued earlier in this lecture, 44 billion tons by 2020. The current statements look to be around 48 or 49. That's compared with business as usual, difficult concept to define, but that probably would have been around 55, 56, 57 in 2020. So if you go, say, from 56 to 48, that's 8, and you need another 4 to get down to 44. So from that perspective, current articulations of ambitions take us two-thirds of the way in 2020 from um, business as usual to where we need to be. Now that's substantial progress. Is it less than we wanted? Of course it is. Is it negligible? No. It's substantial. It's two-thirds of the way from business as usual to where we need to be by 2020. If, of course, everybody delivers according to the ambitions that they have set out. So this is a story of real progress, but progress that is way too short for what we need. And it's only if we think of it in this way that we'll see uh, what we have to do in the nine months or so between now and the conference in Cancun. Now, what would that take us if you look country by country? I haven't got time to go into all the countries in detail. There are a few countries that are absolutely crucial here. China, of course, is fundamental. US and China are of the order of eight, eight or nine, China a bit more than US now, a billion tons, roughly speaking. According to China's plans, if you assume growth rate something similar to the past decade, um, China's um, overall emissions would rise from 8 or 9 now to somewhere between 11 or 12 in 2020. And if China went on in a similar way, so adding another 2.5 or 3, it would start to look like 14 or 15 by 2030. Now remember, I asked you to remember these numbers, and you did all remember them. We have to be well below 35 billion tons of the world by 2030, probably 30 or 32, something around there. If China, taking current plans in 2020 and extrapolating a little bit, moved to 14 or 15, out of China being 17 or 18 percent of the world population by then, out of an overall budget of 30 or 32, it obviously would be extremely difficult to get to that overall budget. You know, if China's nearly half of it, it would be very difficult to get to that overall story. If you run the numbers, because growth in China is a benefit to China and a benefit to the world, if you run the numbers and ask the question, if growth averages over the next 20 years in China around 7%, it's an easy number to deal with because 7% doubles each decade, so two decades of 7% growth, is multiplied by a factor of four. To get back to something like the eight or nine where China is now, something would be close to well, something 25 or 30 percent of the total budget available, then China, to get back to eight or nine, would have to have emissions per unit output divided by a factor of four. If the output's gone up by a factor of four, you've got to come back to where you were. In terms of absolute emissions, you've got to divide emissions by factor of emissions unit output by factor of four. And that can be done. That can be done. Um, it would mean a 20% reduction in energy per unit of output and about a 10% reduction of um, emissions per unit of energy every five year plan. The 11th five year plan just finishing, China looks like it would have met the target of 20 percent reductions in energy per unit of output. What I'm describing is absolutely not impossible. The United States, if you look at the numbers and think of the numbers in rich countries and poor countries across the world, should be dividing emissions per unit output by a factor of four also over the next 20 years. If you look at the articulated intentions, China and the US are planning on dividing emissions per unit output by a factor of two and a half or three. That factor of two and a half or three has got to be raised to something like four. Now again, I'm expressing it in a way that tells us we're planning to go a long way, 
but not far enough. But what we should be aiming for is not so far away from what we're planning as to be regarded as impossible or a pipe dream. It's absolutely not. So we've got to approach this with a sense of urgency, a sense of clarity on the magnitude of the numbers, but also a recognition that these issues are being engaged with and they are being engaged with on something like the right kind of scale. Now, there's delivery and there's plans. One of the big difference between Chinese planning and other people's planning is on the whole China delivers on its plans. And because it takes that seriously, it thinks very hard before it gives commitments. Politicians in other countries think of uh, targets and then another language is it aspiration. No, it's not targets, it's aspiration. No, we tend to take our planning in other countries of the world in a rather more airy way than does uh, China. China likes to work out whether the target that it's discussing can actually be achieved. And China did say to some people towards the end of Copenhagen that, you know, I think we could deliver a bit more than our target. That was greeted well, it was very late in the day, but there was, it wasn't picked up. That was an example of the ways in which had we approached all this in a more collaborative spirit, had we been listening <coughs> to each other all around the world, we could have done so much better at Copenhagen than we in fact did. Uh, there's still an element of the G8 atmospherics there with rich countries thinking that they work it all out and explain to other people what they do. There's the inability to listen closely. There's the thought that everybody else doesn't understand my politics, that you don't think about other people's politics. The politics of the 12 five year plan in China is playing itself out now. It will be published um, in about six months' time. It's absolutely fundamental to this whole story. It's been discussed very intensively. We should be seeing what we can do to help, not giving lectures about uh, what other people have to do and how they have to report back to other people. The question is, plans are being put together around the world. How can we help each other? Had we approached Copenhagen in this kind of way, we would have done much better than we did. They can study international relations, and many people that spend in school on the School of Economics do exactly that. There's also a bit of common sense there. If you want to collaborate with people, you've got to think hard about where they are, what their structure, their society is like, how they come to decisions, in order to be collaborative and constructive. So, I've described Copenhagen itself. I've described key aspects of the last three months on the road to Copenhagen. And I've also, in terms of China's plans, United States plans, plans of other parts of the world, described um, where we should be going. What we're going to need is a raising of our game, not only delivery of the targets that I've been describing, which are already there in the, in the Copenhagen Board submission, we're going to need to raise our game. We're going to ask ourselves, can we do better than that? How can we do better than that? We've got another five, we've got to find another four billion tons, roughly speaking. I believe we can do that. We probably want one and a half from the developing world, one and a half from the rich world, some scope on deforestation and peat, some scope on international aviation and maritime. We really can practically put that extra four billion tons together if we really put our minds to it. But in order to see how we do that in a collaborative way, we're going to have to have real progress, first analytically and then in negotiations, not only on the overall emissions numbers, but on finance as I've described it, many sources of finance that we could bring to the table. Carbon tax revenues as they're coming in in different countries. Auctioning of carbon permits as we should be proceeding to, certainly in Europe and then other parts of the world. We can have a tax on international aviation and maritime. We can have a financial transactions tax. We can, and the IMF is already working on, uh, staff is working on a paper on how to use special drawing rights and depositing the special drawing rights by countries of the world into a new fund, which then uses those in a bit of a Keynes World Bank kind of way to leave a borrowing to bring forward some of the expenditure. There's lots of ideas here on the finance. On the high level panel on finance, we'll be looking at them and sifting through them and weighing them up against the financial criteria and asking ourselves the question, which is the best combination which is the least bad combination relative to the standard criteria of revenue, reliability of revenue, incidence and equity, efficiency, administration, and so on 
Those are the kind of questions that we'll be asking. Similarly, those intense questioning, uh, intense questioning analysis is going on in the Paris Oslo process for deforestation. We're still short of that discussion on, te on, te on technical sharing, on technology sharing. There's a tremendous amount of ideas out there, built some of them building on the kind of techniques that were involved in uh, developing and disseminating new varieties of seed and technology in the Green Revolution. You've got challenge funds and cornerstone funds, trying to be proposed to fund feed-in tariffs. There's a whole range of stories on technological sharing. No shortage of ideas, but what we need is the sifting, the analysis of those ideas in a way that's internationally acceptable that can feed into negotiations. Similarly, on monitoring, reporting, and verification, we don't need, at least I don't think we need, people to go scurrying around other people's countries, measuring in each place. That would be seen as a violation of sovereignty, it's very difficult to put into place. What we need is transparency. You need to understand how measurements and forecasts have been put together. The current measurements, you need to understand of emissions, you need to understand how they've been put together. You need to understand the data sources. They need to be shared. That's transparency. That's the kind of thing which is the bread and butter of life in academic institutions. That's the kind of progress we can make on monitoring, reporting, and verification. If we put it into technology, it's possible that some of this we could get from satellite observation. This is the kind of work, the technical work, that scientists, social scientists, particularly social scientists, need to be very active in over these coming year and months, but also, of course, none of these problems stop in Mexico and COP16 going on uh, after that as well. So I believe very strongly that the role of serious social science, well, of course, I don't, serious social scientists don't science and I mean hard social science, I don't mean as opposed to comical social science. <laughs> but serious social science lies behind the analysis of risk management, of effective, on the scale we need, efficient keeping costs down, and equitable um, sharing of the activities and responsibilities. Serious social science is right there. That's the kind of thing we should be doing every day. It's the kind of clarity of foundations bringing the kind of hard work on the numbers, the kind of relating of our results to real policy decisions and real policy making. That's what we should be doing. That's what we should be teaching our students about, what we should be publishing our papers on, but also what we ourselves should be doing in terms of our own participation in discussions which are clearly vital for the future of our planet. Thank you very much.